And a very good afternoon. Welcome to Issues and Attitudes. My name is Jeff Owens, Interim Manager at WEIU. And on the phone today, Mr. Dale Ryder, Illinois State Senator from the 55th District. Welcome, Dale. Hey, Jeffrey. Thank you. How are you? I'm good, my friend. I'm glad every uh, thing worked out. We appreciate you being able to take some of your time to call in again today with all this going on. We thought it was important to have our state senator on and talk about this pandemic. I'll, I'll let you have the first word. Where do you, where do you want to start? And we'll, we'll go from there, Dale. Well, I would say that uh, probably the what has my constituents' attention the most has been uh, last week's unveiling uh, by Governor Pritzker of his proposed reopening of the economy plan. Uh, it's created quite a stir uh, and and some some significant objections or at least concerns, including from me. Uh, if you look at the governor's reopening plan, it has five phases. The final phase is a phase wherein you have a highly effective treatment for COVID-19 or a vaccine for it. Uh, we are in currently in phase two, according to the governor's plan. There are I, I, I have a number of concerns with the governor's plan, but, but just in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the, the most prominent of those, two of them. First, the governor has split the state into only four regions. Now, by contrast, New York, and New York is, the, is not only kind of the epicenter of yeah. this pandemic, but in, in terms of, of, of geographic diversity and, 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 other, and, and other, uh, uh, other diversity measures, looks a lot like Illinois. I mean, except for New York City's on the south end of New York State, and, of course, Chicago's on the north end, north end of Illinois. But the, other than that, it looks a lot like it. New York is at 11, has 11 different regions. Uh, Governor Cuomo there has recognized that New York State is diverse enough that in an attempt to not tie too many areas to other areas that don't look anything like the first area and uh, in terms of distance or a long ways away, you, you want to be more, uh, have more regions. I think the governor needs to move in that direction. I think the governor needs to go to at least reach, uh, at least 11 regions. If you look at where Coles County is at right now, uh, the fortunes of the small business owner, let's say the small hair salon or barbershop owner in Mattoon or Charleston, is affected by what's going on in Hancock County, which is on the Iowa border more than three hours, almost four hours away, yeah. or Jersey County, which is on the Missouri border, which is three hours away, uh, is the hair salon or the barbershop in Charleston or Mattoon serving those customers? No, they're not. So why are their numbers relevant to what's happening here? Uh, the, the other issue is is that Coles County finds itself in, re, in, a, in the same region as areas that have experienced uh, hot spots, if you will, yeah. that, that we haven't seen. And again, why would that be an issue for the small business owner or small local restaurant in our area? So there's the first concern. The second concern, and it's been widely publicized, is the 28-day wait. 28 day wait yeah. Every other state in the country that has unveiled a plan is at 14 days. The CDC recommendations are 14 days. Now, the governor tries to nuance that by saying, well, his plan says 28 consecutive days of level or dropping COVID-19 positive cases, whereas the 14-day measure is only dropping. Well, that's not a significant difference, Jeff. I mean, it, 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 and so we are, we are calling on the governor publicly and we are talking to his people privately to get at least those two issues changed. Okay. And I was wondering about the 28 days where he came up for that, because it's obviously double of the 14. Is, is it, was it that simple of thought process that you think, or is it? Is, I is think the governor, the governor's not been willing to disclose that. I, the governor continues, when he has asked questions, the specific questions about, okay, where did this number come from, or where did that measure come from, or where did this criteria come from? The governor says, well, I'm relying upon science. I'm relying upon the updated models. But other than the two epidemiologists who appeared at one of his press briefings a couple weeks ago, you really don't know much about the people who are counseling the governor on these issues. And as he puts out things like this, which kind of are outliers compared to the rest of the nation, I think that prompts a lot more of those questions, as it should, as it should. I mean, if there's some significant medical evidence out there that demonstrates why Illinois should be at 28 when the rest of the country can be at 14, then we need to know where that comes from. 
you uh, say that you would rather Illinois be divided into more regions, 11, I believe, is your, what you said, uh, like New York. Other things that would be in a Dale Ryder plan to reopen the, in, in terms of safety and precautions and things like that? Well, I would, I would probably go more than 11 regions, actually. I mean, I think that we're trying to, we're, we're trying to pin our advocacy to the governor to something that someone has already done. I mean, uh, I think you can make a good argument for county regions. Everyone stand on their own. Now, now there, are, there are some people who would say, well, the risk in that is if you're next door to a county that hasn't moved to the next phase, are people from that county who, where they have a higher COVID infection rate, are they just coming over to your restaurants and bars? Well, that's a, that's a fair issue, right? Yep. And it needs to be talked out. But I, I, I think 11 is the baseline of where we need to go. One of the other issues that's, that is, uh, in fact, I'll mention two that aren't as widely talked about in the press. One is this, the, what has been advertised as the COVID death rate or the COVID death numbers. Yeah. Uh, th- th- those, are not, those are not necessarily deaths that are driven primarily by the coronavirus. Um, in fact, the, uh, to her credit, the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, Dr. Nzike, admitted in one of the governor's press briefings a couple of weeks ago that if someone has been admitted to hospice and is expected to live another 48 or 72 hours or maybe a week and they happen to test positive and then they pass away as expected the state is registering that as a covid death um the per, the, the the person who dies in an auto accident if they were tested positive that's a co- I, I i i think that's a mistake because when you do that you give people reason to question everything else that you are saying. And it kind of increases the panic that we probably exactly. don't need in, in any of these communities. That's right. So I, I, would, I would refine that statistic. Another thing that I would do, uh, the governor has a measure, in, in one of the criteria that these regions have to meet is hospitalizations of people with, and this is the quote, COVID-like symptoms. Well, I, I don't like that because it is, that's very subjective. If you have a fever and a cough, it could be attributable to a dozen different reasons having nothing to do with the coronavirus. To me, the hard measure needs to be the positive test. There you go. And there was also the rumor going around, and it may just be a rumor, that if, if a person died in a hospital, the hospital, there was some financial gain if they were listed under corona. Is that true or not true? I mean, there's no, been so many No, stories. there's not. I mean, not that I'm aware. I'm not okay. aware of any financial gain. All, all it does is make your area look like it has more of a problem than it really does, which turns into a problem for the economy, which is a problem for all of us, whether we recognize that or not. Uh, that, uh, the, what's going on now with our economy and the uh, the still increasing unemployment rate, yeah, when again, the, that the is next. a huge issue for all of us, yes. Unemployment's at an all-time high. Um, let's talk about Illinois, though. <clears throat> Where does Illinois stand and, and what what can be done about it in, uh, in, the, in the short-term and long-term plans, Dale? Well, I mean, uh, uh, yesterday morning the White House pegged the national unemployment rate at 14 percent. Now, Illinois usually runs a point or two higher than the rest of the country. That's been a chronic condition of ours for almost a generation. And remember, those are the people who are searching for work. There are Then you have another block of citizens who are no longer searching for work. So that number is not 14 in Illinois. That number is probably 20 or north of 20 in Illinois, to be realistic about it. Uh, what can you do about that? The first thing, I mean, obviously, we need to. I think we need to change the plan and, and move areas in which we can safely reopen, move them along more quickly. The other I- issue is uh, uh, the Illinois Department of Employment Security is a complete mess. Uh, since this, uh, since the governor started uh, issuing executive orders in the middle of March, and the federal government then expanded their unemployment systems. Uh, 80, 80 to 90 percent of the calls that come into my office are because people are logging on to the Illinois Department of Employment Security's website to employ uh, to apply for unemployment benefits like they've been told to do uh, by the governor, and they're getting kicked out of the system. They're not, their claims aren't being recognized. The governor has promised repeatedly this will be fixed. In fact, I think today is the latest deadline that he issued to fix that. Now, to be fair to the governor, he, he that, that system is getting flooded like it's never been flooded before. Yeah. And, but I, I do think there was a little bit of a lack of thought through. I mean, I think there was such a rush to shut the economy down and put these executive orders in place 
that they weren't necessarily prepared to deal with what was going to be the most significant ramification of that. And that was the unemployment system getting buried. Uh, if you believe the governor's office, they are they're digging their way out of that. Uh, I think a lot of my constituents are scratching their heads wondering not whether they can believe that or not. Uh, if people are having issues, we encourage them to reach out to our office, and we are trying to get to Springfield through separate routes. The other thing is the meat processing. Uh, it's mm-hmm. been a national uh, a national story as well as an Illinois story. Um, what what's being done, and give us an update from Dale Ryder's perspective. So, I mean, I've been on the phone with lots of uh, agriculture producers, livestock producers in my district. I've also been on the uh, phone with the Illinois Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and and a couple of the processing facilities in the state. And what you have here is uh, the, the facilities that process uh, beef and pork, have some in the state have experienced some measure of coronavirus in their facilities, and so those workers had to be sent home. Some workers didn't want to come to work because they were concerned about getting it, and some of the processors... Uh, where maybe each employee had a, a, a certain area of three three feet maybe to do their processing work. They've said, you know what, we need to expand that to six feet. Well, you do that, you reduce the capaci- capacity. Yeah. Um, for example, the, the processing facility over in Beardstown, which is a pork processing facility, uh, when it's up and running uh, at full strength, processes 20,000 head of hog a day, 20,000. Well, it's down to 15. Now, people say, well, that's still three quarters. You're doing okay. What people, most people don't appreciate is that the livestock uh, production and processing uh, chain that we have in this country is actually very finely tuned. I mean, so if you have a backup of even 1,000 per day, that creates enormous ripple effects throughout the entire industry. And what you're left with is producers throughout the state who have hogs that they can't get to market. And uh, those hogs, uh, at some point, I mean, and we're going to we'll be prepared to see this, is you're going to see producers killing off their own livestock. Yeah, and there's uh, been I some mean, of that happen out in the, uh, the Minnesota and the Plain States, correct? Right, there's because a, they, don't, they don't have another choice. Yeah. They, they, don't, they simply don't have another choice if they're going to stay open uh, for business. There's nowhere for those hogs to go because they're getting another shipment in. And so uh, we're going to have that problem, and that problem's going to exist for a little while. Now... I'm told that the plants that were shut down in Illinois, no one is shut down now. There were a couple that were shut down temporarily. They're back up and running. Uh, No one is running at 100% capacity. Most of them are running at between, I'd say, 60 and 80% capacity. But at least for the next couple, three months, that this ripple effect is going to have to work its way through the livestock economy, and then hopefully we'll get back on our feet for this time next year. When I was thinking about this uh, show on on Friday, I was feeling really good about the Coles County, which is our hometown here uh, for Eastern Mattoon and Charleston. But over the weekend, seven new cases mm-hmm. of uh, of, the, of the virus uh, concerns, or is that an abnormal? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, well, sure. I mean, it, it, it's a concern, but I just think you have to keep it in perspective, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that brings the grand total in Coles County to 20 or 20, 20 maybe 25. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and we have 50,000 residents. So let's keep that in perspective. And let's also remember that the numbers are going to go up by virtue of nothing else other than you're testing more people. I mean, yeah. you're expanding the universe that you're testing, so those numbers are going to go up. Now, and, and I don't know anyone who is able to articulate with a fine point exactly to what degree those increases are due simply to increased testing as opposed to those increased cases due to the spread of the virus. We're only going to get that answer over a period of the next few weeks. Now, uh, my, Coles County has, starting today, I believe, a uh, testing out at uh, Sarah Bush Lincoln Health yeah, System for essential testing, workers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you have to call out there, and I want to be clear on that. People you can't just drive out there yeah. and roll up somewhere. You have to call in advance, and I would encourage people, if they're interested in doing that, get on Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System's website. There'll be information there to call and make an appointment. The testing right now is restricted to people who work in, quote-unquote, essential functions or essential businesses. At some point, as the tests become more available, that'll, that universe will become more sprite, as it has, as it has been doing every week.
Okay. Let's start it. Okay. okay. Let's turn a little bit to the state budget. I know uh, what can be done and can anything be done. I know that you said last time you were on that there really you guys have to all be in Springfield to legally discuss the budget. Is anything being addressed that way to change that so you guys can do it via teleconference or Zoom or Well, we're, we're having meetings. I mean, I, as I think we talked about, we're, we're having me- Zoom meetings uh, every single morning. In, on this, now, this is on the Senate side. Yeah. So. Uh, an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, along with the budget staff, get on a Zoom meeting. We're on it from, it starts at 8.30 in the morning, <laughs> usually wraps up by 10 or 10.30 in the morning, and we're doing that every single day. And what we're doing is we're going through lines of the budget to see where areas can be reduced. We're also keeping an eye on the revenue projections. Uh, it shouldn't come as any a surprise is that when you shut businesses down, uh, there's less taxes being paid. Uh, people yeah. are making less money. Uh, people who were earning a salary but who are on unemployment are no longer paying those taxes because unemployment isn't subject to income tax. I mean, there's a, there's a massive, again, another ripple effect that goes through the economy that affects the state budget. So I mean, the governor has talked about for the coming fiscal year, which begins on July 1st, the gap between what he wanted to spend, so he introduced a budget in February, yeah. what he wanted to spend, and the revenue projection that we have now available for fiscal year 2020 is $7.2 billion. Now, Jeff, in my 22 years, I've seen some budget deficits. I've never seen one that big. That's tw- that, in fact, that's, that is twice the size of anything that we've ever seen in over a generation. And it might be the largest one we've ever seen in Illinois history. Is it even possible to, to cut 7.2 it, or to cut it in half if that's the... No, I think what's going to happen is... What, what, what I think we should do is, is go through and cut as much as you can and then see if you can short-term borrow to cover the, the rest. We, we've utilized that strategy before where over, let's say, a period of three years, you short-term borrowed, let's say... Two and a half billion dollars in the first year. Now, short-term borrow means you have to repay it in 12 months. The next year, you uh, short-term borrow a little bit less, and the next year a little bit less, and you get that down to where by the time the economy comes back and revenues come back out, they meet your expenditure. So the question is, how do you deal with that interim, that bridge period? And short-term borrowing is a is a common tool. And it's a it's just a twelve month uh, mechanism. Now, can we get there? I don't I don't know. That, that that's the exercise we're going through right now. And on top of short term borrowing, coupled against we really don't know when things are going. And I hate to go back to normal saying, but we don't when things aren't going to get back to normal. So, is that that has to factor in there at some point? Well, it does. I mean, but but and and, and now we're. I, I want to circle back to what we opened with. Is that's why I, I hope that the that the governor is listening to the public health experts, but boy, he needs to be listening to his economic experts too and his people in his Department of Revenue because if the governor is slower, if Illinois is slower than everyone else, we are driving consumers out of Illinois. I mean, do we really think that if Indiana gets to a better place than we are, let's say a month before us, that people who live within 45 minutes or an hour of the state line aren't going to Indiana? Sure they are. They absolutely are. And that's going to happen in every border area in this state, which will aggravate the revenue issue. And I think that that's the, that's the pitch that myself and I think a lot of other Republicans are making to the governor as governor. You know what? One, I'm not sure that your plan in all its facets is warranted, particularly in areas like East Central Illinois or, or, or downstate Illinois. But two... By, by slowing things down unnecessarily, you're actually aggravating the budget situation, which is already going to be very difficult. Because Missouri is mostly open right now anyway. When you think right. a lot and, more, you know. And I hear reports, I heard reports today from, uh, from, from someone I know here, uh, over here in Mattoon, that there were a handful of people from Mattoon who went to Missouri for the weekend. Now, that's a pretty good haul, right? That's, I mean, you're talking about... That's two and a half, three hours to uh, at least to the border. Yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> and so, I mean, we should, we should, we, that, that should be instructive to us, that if we're going to lag behind other states unnecessarily, we're going to pay an economic price for that as well. There you go. There is so many people voicing opinions on the virus, politicians, you know, CDC, every educator from every major university in the country, um, Fauci and Trump and you know, Pritzker. So... 
what do the people out there, where should we, where do you think we should focus listening to what should be done as we move forward in, in, during this pandemic? I tell you what, I would encourage people to uh, uh, listen to the White House and the governor's briefings. And I know, I mean, that some people are like, well, I don't want to hear that politician talk. Okay, these are officials giving out information. And, uh, and I think you need to stay in tune with that. Um, now, to the extent that they start chirping at other people and blaming them for that, now, I would welcome you to tune out there because that's nonsense. I mean, it, uh, you notice the governor's really not doing that any longer. And I think it's because the governor got pushback that blaming the federal government for not having a sufficient number of tests uh, not only came off as partisan politics, but it was really unreasonable. I mean, do, did we think that the federal government had a COVID-19 test manufacturing plant? Right. I mean, no. Every, everyone started from ground zero on this, right? Yes. Um, just like people have been critical of the governor for the fact that uh, for, for weeks when, we, when this got started, you'd send a COVID-19 test kit that had been done on someone to one of the state labs, whether it was in Springfield or Chicago. It took days to get that back. It took days to get it back. And people were critical of the governor. Well, the, the governor's labs weren't we're not prepared to deal with this issue either. So everyone needs to just relax when it comes to pointing fingers. The other thing that I would suggest welcome people to do is, is that my office has established on Facebook a COVID-19 informational page. Uh, what we do is we take all of the, in, the official information that we get, all the reports and everything we can get our hands on, and we load it onto that page. And we, we, put, we post at least twice a day information onto that page there's no political commentary on there you're not going to read a you're not going to read a word from me on there um there are people who go on and comment but uh, i mean the point is there's official information out there and i would just encourage people to avail themselves of the reliable information that exists out there because there's a lot of it I want to touch a little bit today uh, on churches because that's the other yeah. hot topic yeah. out there. People think that their church should be open. Some people say no. It's just too many. You know, what, what, what are, and I know this is a touchy subject, but I have to ask. You know, what are your thoughts on this? And I, I, this? I uh, okay, I, I'll just and, and I appreciate the, the 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 question, and I'll just strip all the varnish off and give you a. Com- I, I'm a born again Christian. I believe that churches are essential businesses. Uh, and they should have been designated as such from the start. I think the governor was wrong not to do that. Uh, having said that, I think that the leaders of our churches need to have due regard for those who who go to church and due regard for the law. I mean, the, the Scripture teaches that. that. Um, I think there's a way for us to, whether it's virtual church services or have services, uh, multiple services, There's a way to manage uh, these issues. But, you know, if someone decides that they want to have a church service and um, and it's in the gray area of one of these executive orders, uh, I'm not going to tell them not to do it, Jeff. I'm not going to tell them not to do it. Just like if someone's not sure whether they should state a public opinion, but they have the right to go out there on the street corner and say it, I'm going to tell them, go do it then. That's your right. Uh, So I've had lots of lots of conversations with uh, members of the clergy, not just here in Coles County, but throughout my Senate district. You know, you're not supposed to have gatherings of more than 10. Uh, I know churches who are, are, whose sanctuaries allow them to have five meetings of 10 people apiece. They all, have be ha- they all happen to be listening to the same message. Um, I'm not sure the public health people will like that, but the bottom line is, uh, I think that's a I think that's a responsible and incredibly important thing to do. Okay, I appreciate the honest answer. The other thing that's driving people nuts is hair salons and barber shops. Uh, right. They they you know I don't know if it's that big a deal because I you know but there are a lot of people that are out there hammering that. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, my constituents are right on that. Uh, I, I mean, for this has probably been one of the most irritating issues that I've had with the governor and the mayor of Chicago. You'll remember that yeah. that several weeks ago the, uh, the mayor admitted that she'd had her hair done, and when questioned about that, bristled. I mean, it was really, uh, uh, the fact that she did it was an exercise in hypocrisy. Her reaction was offensive. Um, It was like, how dare you question me? Not unlike the governor's response when someone pointed out that his wife and children had flown down a non-essential travel to their $12 million Florida state. Uh, Look, leaders can't go out and pronounce things and preach things and then act in a different kind of way. And so, and the, and the, and the real rub here with regards to barbers and, and, and hair salons, Jeff, is that the governor's current executive order 
says that if you are going to go into a place of public accommodation, like a Walmart, and it's crowded, you should wear a mask. The inference from that is that as long as you have a mask on and everyone else has a mask on, it's safe, right? Mm -hmm. That's the inference. So if that's the case, how can it not also be safe for the barber and the customer to be wearing masks and while the barber's cutting the hair? I don't, there's a logical, uh, breathtaking inconsistency between those two. And that, I think the governor needs to move in the direction of opening the non-essentials with social distancing or mask requirements. Let people get back to work. Okay, a couple more minutes with Senator Dale Ryder today. Um, with all this going on, budget and all this stuff, do you, do you wish you were running in the fall just, just to stay involved in this? Or are you, are you, gl- are you glad it's oh over? Oh, my goodness. I mean, now, that was the one question I did not expect to get from you. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I, honestly, I haven't, I haven't thought about it in those terms. Jeff, Too busy? <laughs> we're so busy here. And, I mean, I just I, – I, I have not spent time reflecting on my decision, except for I know that that my decision was the right decision for me. And I've been in office. When I leave, it'll be 23 years. Uh, and, and this job, day in, day out, week in, week out, has been a blessing to me, even though some days I had trouble recognizing the blessing. But uh, it has been. But it's time for someone new to start. But, uh, you know, there's, there's people that I will miss in this. There are things that I will miss in this. But that's true every time we change chapters in our lives. The senior high school kids, more than likely, or more than in that area, did not get a walk. Uh, you had about 30 seconds, Dale, to tell them what you think of them, the kids who did not get a walk across the stage this uh, this May. Bless each and every one of them. Uh, I, I, good for them. Congratulations to them. I hope that all of us find a way to give them adulation in any way possible, whether that's on social media or sending a note or making a call. My youngest, Ben, actually graduated from Iowa State University and East Carolina University with two separate degrees on Saturday. And so, you know, we, we do what we can. And, 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 and don't, don't lose the fact that for these young people, not only are they going to be the answer to some obscure trivia question 20 years from now, but this is a tremendous learning experience for them. Yep, it is a tremendous learning experience for them. But you know what? I hope all of us make an extra effort uh, to congratulate those people and give them adulation because this is a this is kind of a tough thing for them. It has been nuts. Absolutely crazy. Dale Ryder, I appreciate you calling in today on Issues and Attitudes. Always good to hear you and get your opinions about what we can do during this pandemic. Appreciate it very much, my friend. You bet, Jeff. Have a great day. We'll have you on soon. This is Tell WEIU. Everybody have a great day out there.